Yes, brilliant. So thanks again, John, for having me. Um, yeah, today I want to tell you a little story about the usefulness of random states, of random pure quantum states when it comes to the simulation of quantum many-body dynamics. And this talk is basically split into two parts, although as you will see, these two parts are very closely connected with each other. So in the first part, I want to give you a broad overview. What are the different applications of random pure states? And this is joint work with um, my PhD advisor, Robin Steiningeweg, and we have written some kind of mini review where we describe these different applications. And in the second part of this talk, I want to come uh, to these, uh, how random states might be useful even on these uh, near-term noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. And this is work together with Arijit Pal from UCL. So let me start with a very brief introduction. I'm sure this, this is pretty much familiar to you. So I'm interested in the dynamics of quantum many-body systems and in particular isolated quantum systems where time evolution is unitary. And in such systems, a very popular uh, protocol to induce a non-equilibrium situation is to prepare some initial state. So psi zero, this might be, for instance, an eigenstate of some Hamiltonian HI. And then at some point in time, there's a sudden perturbation where some parameter of your Hamiltonian changes. So the Hamiltonian changes to some final Hamiltonian HF and your initial state is no eigenstate anymore of this Hamiltonian and evolves in time. And you can study the resulting non-equilibrium dynamics. So you can write this down, of course, very straightforwardly. What, but when you do this in practice, so you really want to calculate this time evolution exactly, you quickly run into what is often called the quantum many-body problem. Say your system is, for example, such a spin one-half chain of length L, then you could, in principle, just rewrite this time evolution as follows. So you expand your initial state in terms of the eigenstates and the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And then you just have to sum over these two to the L contributions. But you already see the Hilbert space dimension grows as two to the L. So if you're interested in larger and larger systems, this becomes more and more demanding and you quickly run out of memory or you run out of time because you have to store your uh, Hamiltonian matrix in memory. And then you also need the time to diagonalize it. So you are restricted to rather small system sizes with exact diagonalization. So there are in principle two approaches to tackle this quantum many-body problem. The first approach is, well, you can just use bigger computers. For example, here, this is the supercomputer Joules in Jülich. Um, but even with big computers, at some point, you just uh, run out of memory. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to combine, you want to combine the use of big computers with efficient numerical methods. And as you know, there are, of course, a lot of different numerical methods, usually each with its own advantages and disadvantages, depending on the specific situation. And here, I just picked one example, which, which is very popular. These are matrix product states. So if you have a weakly entangled state psi, then you can compress it efficiently into these products of matrices. And this saves you a lot of memory and you can tackle larger system sizes. And you can also efficiently time evolve these matrix product states by these trotter decompositions of the time evolution operator. But also these matrix product states have a disadvantage. And this is when you have a quantum many body system, then during the time evolution, entanglement typically builds up rather rapidly. And at some point in time, your wave function is just too entangled and you can't compress it anymore. So your simulation has a finite cutoff in time. Okay, so we have big computers and we have efficient numerical methods. And what I want to tell you today is that random states in some cases also provide a rather useful numerical approach to study the dynamics of quantum many-body systems. So first we have to state what is a random state. So um, we call, I call it during this talk always P, and P can be constructed, for example, as such a superposition. So K can be any complete set of basis states, for example, your computational basis. So just the product basis of your uh, spin up and spin down operators that you might be used to when you work with spin one half systems. And 
These coefficients CK are complex numbers and the real and imaginary parts should be drawn from a Gaussian distribution with zero mean. And if you do this, you end up with a state that is uniformly distributed in the Hilbert space. So why are these states, these random states useful? Well, as you will see, at the end of the day, everything boils down to the fact that random states are great trace estimators. So what do I mean by this? Say you have some operator O or some matrix representation of this operator and you want to calculate the trace, then in principle, you can do this by calculating the expectation value of O within this random state and then you average over a lot of random states. So this overline here means averaging over different random states. And then you can, well, you can expand this. And I mean, this equation might not be mathematically completely rigorous, but I hope you, uh, you, get, what I, you get the point that I want to convey here that uh, you have this matrix elements of the operator between the states K and K prime. And when you do the average over these random coefficients that are independently drawn from each other, then on average, the off diagonal parts will cancel out and only the diagonal parts will survive. So what you end up is with the trace of the operator. And here you get this normalization by the Hilbert space dimension because we here implicitly assumed that the state is normalized. Okay, so this is already nice, but what you can then also do is you can look at the uh, variance of this random state approximation. So at the sample to sample fluctuations, how much does a specific random state differs from the ensemble average? And you can in principle calculate this and the expression is given here. And I won't go into too much details on how you can derive this. And instead I would highly recommend this review that I'm citing here on the top. And this review actually has the same title, random state technology, and there you find a lot of details on what you can do with random states and also a lot of these mathematical details and on the error bounds. So I can highly recommend this one. So let's have one more look at this expression here for the sample to sample uh, fluctuations. So as I've said before, usually you are often, uh, you're often interested in large systems. So your Hilbert space dimension also becomes rather large. Then due to this prefactor one over Hilbert space dimension plus one, this number will typically be rather small. So if you increase your system sizes, the sample to sample fluctuations become very small. However, we have to be a bit careful. We also have the second term here, which is basically the uh, spectral variance of your operator O. And this also should, well, should stay well behaved when you go towards the thermodynamic limit. So you might, you might encounter problems where your operator, where the spectral variance of your operator grows faster than the Hilbert space dimension. I mean, you think you, you might think you can construct something like this. And then this, then this product wouldn't be small, but the important point is that for all physical problems that we want to study in the following, this red box here will typically behave very well. So, it doesn't increase faster than the Hilbert space dimension. So the product of these two guys here will be very small. And when you have a large enough system, then even a single state, a single random state is sufficient to approximate the trace very accurately. And this is what is called typicality, that a single random state can faithfully approximate the full statistical ensemble. So, well, a trace of some operator might not be too interesting. So what is more interesting is that you can extend this notion of typicality to time dependent quantities. And that is, this is what in the literature is often referred to as dynamical quantum typicality. And I here want to show you just one example how, how this might be useful. So say you consider such a, a equilibrium average at infinite temperature. So at infinite temperature, this equilibrium average reduces, reduces just to the trace divided by the Hilbert space dimension. And here we are interested in correlation functions. So time dependent correlation functions of some operator O at some point, in, at some point T uh, with itself at time zero. And also in this case, you can now replace the trace by a random pure state and here I've written out explicitly the time dependence of the operator in the Heisenberg picture. And 
Now I can rewrite this once more by introducing these two pure states, psi of t, which is just the time evolved state, the time evolved random state, and phi of t, which looks almost the same, but there's just this additional operator O. So you might now ask, what do I gain from this rewriting? Well, the important point is that the time evolution of a pure state, in fact, doesn't require exact diagonalization at all, but instead you can use space as sparse matrix methods. Uh, for example, Krulov subspace techniques, Trotter decompositions, Chebyshev polynomials, you name it. It doesn't matter in practice so much. What all these methods have in common is that you don't have to store the full Hamiltonian matrix. So this full two to the L times two to the L matrix. And as a consequence, you save a lot of memory and you can treat systems uh, which are significantly larger compared to standard exact diagonalization. And when you compare this um, to this previous method that I also mentioned, these MPS or time dependent density matrix renormalization group methods, in this case, we don't have any cutoff in time because entanglement is no limiting factor here. Because even if you look at time zero, this random state, which with we start with, uh, is already almost maximally entangled because it's so random. So in principle, you can just take your stake and evolve it up to the desired time you're interested in. But of course, so I will later show you some system styles that you can reach with typicality. Those will definitely be smaller than with TDMRG, but there might still be some intermediate window where you have comparatively large system sizes and you can also go to comparatively long times. And this can give you uh, some advantage uh, compared to other methods. Okay, so this is basically the main idea of dynamical quantum typicality. And I should mention that we haven't invented this. So in fact, the usefulness of random states, I would say has been discovered and rediscovered very often over time and in different contexts. So not only for these correlation functions here, but also for a lot of different quantities. And as you can see here, so I just list a couple of references, there are even more. And the first one goes back to, the first one that I found goes back to 75. So random states have been used for numeric purposes uh, for quite a long time. Um, and the other point that I wanted to mention is that this notion of typicality, you might also read this quite often when, it, when, it, uh, when it's about the foundations of statistical mechanics. So how thermodynamic behavior emerges in isolated quantum systems. And also in this context, random states play an important role. But uh, today in this talk, I only focus on the numerical aspect of these random states. Okay, so I basically have given you the main idea how typicality works. And now I want to give you an overview of some physical situations or problems that you might encounter where these random states can be really useful. And the first thing is time dependent equilibrium correlation function. So I already, sh I already showed you these correlation functions and the those can be used to study transport properties, for example. So th this uh, is probably not new for some of you. Uh, the other point that I want to emphasize, uh, that I want to advertise here is uh, quench dynamics with thermal initial states. So in the beginning, I told you that in these quantum quenches, you have a pure initial state, but there might also be other situations where your initial state is not pure, but a mixed state. And in these cases, typicality can also be very useful. And then I also mentioned some other applications, uh, which I won't go into too much detail, but I think they might be interesting for what you are doing in Dublin. And so this will be roughly the first part and I won't go into too much detail because I want to save some time also for the second part uh, where I want to speak about uh, how random states might also be useful on these noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Okay, so let's start with time dependent correlation functions. And these correlation functions can be used to study transport properties. And they can be used because these correlation functions can be related to transport coefficients, for example, the diffusion coefficient. And we use this here to study spin transport in the spin one half Heisenberg chain. So this is an integrable spin chain. 
but only because it's integrable doesn't mean that you can solve anything very easily. And especially trans, uh, spin transport in this, in this model has been debated for a long time. And you can study sp uh, spin transport by introducing the spin current, which is given here. So you can think about this as just some uh, movement or uh, spin flips which travel through the system. And you get the diffusion coefficient as the integral over the current current correlation function. And exactly this correlation function can be calculated very efficiently with typicality, with random states. So here on the right, you see some numerical data for this current current correlation function. So it decays with time. And here we not only get uh, data for comparatively large systems, but we also do another trick if you wish. We combine this typicality method with another numerical approach, which is called numerical link cluster expansions. So unfortunately, I, I can't go into too much detail here, but the important point is that we now not only get data for finite systems, but even for systems in the thermodynamic limit, so infinite lengths. And when you now take this current current correlation function and do the integral, then you get the diffusion coefficient, which is shown here in the inset. And you see that at long times, you get this power low growth uh, of d of t. And this particular exponent, so this t to the one third, uh, has been predicted in the literature. And it indicates the transport in this isotropic Heisenberg chain is super diffusive. And later on in this talk, I will come back to this super diffusive transport uh, in more detail. So what you see here is that when you look at transport properties, typicality can be really useful because you can study these current current correlation functions for relatively large systems and also relatively long times. And this is exactly the regime where you would expect that hydrodynamic behavior shows up. Okay, so there's actually also another way to look at transport properties. And this is by uh, looking at the spreading of local density. So we look at spin-spin correlation functions, so local SZ operators, and we calculated this quantity in the number of non-integrable spin chains or ladders. So for example, you pick your Heisenberg chain and add some integrability breaking perturbation, for example, some next nearest neighbor interaction, or you change the geometry and go to ladders. And what you do in this case is, is you can, for example, look at the spreading of this initial spin excitation, how it broadens with time. And you look at the width, how the width evolves with time. And for these non-integral spin chains, you typically find that this grows proportional with time. And this then indicates normal diffusive transport. So in contrast to the super diffusive transport that we had, well, that we had before for the Heisenberg chain. So, so this is what one typically expect for these non-integral spin chains. I know that uh, in your group, you have uh, found some exceptions uh, to this rule, but yeah, this is say the typical behavior for these non-integrable chains. Okay. Um, another thing you can do is you, know, you, you don't only look at the, uh, of the spreading of the correlations, but you look at cuts at finite times. And these cuts are shown here. I mean, this is for different systems. This is now for a spin ladder. And you see that for all these times shown, both for spin transport and energy transport, these correlations grow uh, or broaden like Gaussians. And these Gaussian profiles can also be interpreted as a clear indication of normal diffusive transport. So let me just make one quick comment about the system sizes that you can reach here. So here you already see it. It's a spin chain with in total 36 uh, lattice side. So this is definitely larger than you can do with exact diagonalization. And also here on the bottom, you see here uh, uh, the sites are labeled from 1 to 20. But actually, this is data for spin ladder. So this is actually data for 2 times 20, so 40 spin 1 halves. Uh, and this is exact time evolution. So this is probably twice as large as you could do with exact diagonalization. I mean, I'm not sure if this is some kind of world record for exact time evolution of these spin models. But yeah, I should note that these system sizes can of course only be reached when you have access to these large supercomputers in Mulich, but I think it's, it's a really nice result. Okay, so one thing which is also uh, 
pretty helpful in some cases is that if you have these local spin-spin correlations, you also get information in momentum and frequency just for free, basically. Because you can just do a Fourier transform or two Fourier transforms to momentum space and to frequency space. And sometimes this helps you because maybe in real space, it is not so easy to analyze transport, but when you then go to a different representation, things become much clearer. And in the case of diffusion, you, for example, expect that these uh, density modes, the different momenta Q, decay as exponentials um, for small momenta. And if you then go to frequency space, then you find these Lorentzian line shapes at uh, small at small wave numbers. And you can also plot this in this form, which you might have seen if you look at uh, data from inelastic neutron scattering or so. This is often called the dynamical structure factor. So you have this, uh, this color plot as a function of the momentum and the frequency. And here for small momenta, you see exactly these Lorentzian line shapes. And then in the center of the Brion zone, you have this broad excitation continuum because this is all data at effectively infinite temperature. Okay, so this is what I wanted to tell you about transport. So now I want to come to these uh, quench dynamics with mixed initial states. And so, yeah, in the beginning, I introduced these quenches with pure states, but now we have a, a little bit different situation in mind. So consider, for example, a situation where you have your system described by some Hamiltonian H1, and it is in contact with some large heat bath at some inverse temperature beta. And then other, under some assumptions, uh, which you know better than I do, weak coupling between the system and the bath, for example, we can assume that, the, that this uh, system can be described uh, by this density matrix here of Gibbs form. So we have this E to the minus beta H. So this is our initial state. And then at some point in time, uh, there's again a perturbation which causes the Hamiltonian to change. And in this particular situation we, here, we then assume that there's no further interaction between system and bath. So the system now evolves unitarily again, according to the von Neumann equation. And if you would want to study such a situation on your computer, it's again very demanding because you have to deal with the full density matrix. But again, random states can be really helpful because you can mimic this initial density matrix again by a, pu uh, by a pure random state. So you pick a random state and then you apply the square root of this density matrix. And this is really easy in practice. You can just do this by imaginary time evolution also with your sparse matrix method of choice. And after you prepare this initial state, you can then do again a uh, normal real-time evolution now with respect to this Hamiltonian H2. And you can study the resulting non-equilibrium dynamics for some operator O, which might have been in equilibrium with respect to H1, but is now out of equilibrium uh, with respect to this new Hamiltonian H2. And I just want to show you uh, one example uh, where, we, where we studied this uh, such a situation. And this is a uh, a one-dimensional chain of interacting fermions um, in a disordered potential. So this is like a standard model to study the many-body localization transition. And in this case, uh, we considered a system where initially there's an additional potential in the, in the center, or there's a dip in the potential uh, in the center of the chain. So this would, would cause the particles to to concentrate around this, around this uh, point in space. And then later you, you remove this additional potential. So this would be the quench. Now this additional potential is not there anymore. And you see how this initial say wave packet spreads with time. So you have seen such plots before on the previous slides, but now you have the case of disorder. So uh, you don't see normal diffusion, but, diffusion, but your, your particles stay much closer to the center. And this would then be a way to study many body localization. And in this context, I just wanted to make one comment because there's often some kind of a misconception that, that you can't use these, uh, these random states or this typicality method when you deal with many body localization. Because 
as you might know, in the many body localized system, so called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis breaks down. And also in integrable systems, I showed you before, the ETH also doesn't hold. But uh, what I show you here is that indeed you can use uh, these typicality methods and these random states also for these MBL problems because typicality is actually unrelated to properties or say, yeah, it's basically unrelated to properties of the Hamiltonian and it's unrelated to concepts such as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Okay, so let me just briefly mention some other nice applications of random states that I hope you might be interested in. So uh, one quantity that has become uh, that has become very popular over the recent years, I would say, are these out of time order correlators. So instead of these two point correlation functions I showed you before, you now have uh, four operators here and two time arguments well, at the same time. But yeah, it looks a bit more complicated than this two point correlation function I showed you before. But it shouldn't surprise you that also in this case, I can now replace the trace again by a pure state. And I can rewrite this correlation function in terms of these random states that are defined here. It's a bit more demanding in this case numerically because you have to evolve these states forward and backward in time. But in principle, you can still do this and you can do this for relatively large systems that were shown, for example, here in this nice work by David Luiz and Yevgeny Balev. Uh, okay, so another application is uh, you can actually use random states and typicality arguments to probe the validity of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So this also shows you that the ETH is actually, uh, the typicality and the ETH are in some sense unrelated to each other. And I can't go into too much detail here for reasons of time, but in essence, what the ETH tells you is that if you have some physical operator and you write it in the eigenbasis of your Hamiltonian, then you expect that the diagonal matrix elements form a smooth function of energy. Of course, if you have only a finite system size, then it won't be perfectly smooth and you always have some fluctuations of the diagonal matrix elements. But what you would expect is that when you go to the thermodynamic limit, so you increase your system size, then these fluctuations become smaller and smaller. And Typicality actually provides you with a way to, to study the size of these fluctuations that I don't explain you here in detail how it works, but the important ingredient is that you can create such an energy filtered state. So you again prepare a completely random state and then you apply some energy filter, which you can again do by exact uh, uh, by uh, imaginary time evolution. And by doing so, you are in principle possible to study the, the validity of the ETH for system sizes out of reach for standard exact diagonalization. And last but not least, uh, one point which is uh, more spec uh, speculative, and I only included it because I know that, that you are also interested in open quantum systems. So you have basically seen this plot before. So we are again interested in the situation where we have the thermal initial density matrix, and then we do the quench and evolve it in time with respect to some other Hamiltonian H2. But now, uh, compared to the previous case, I, I, I now allow for some interaction with the environment in form of dissipation, which are right here in this uh, Lindblad form. So we have the standard unitary evolution of the density matrix, but then there's also this uh, dissipative part, which yeah. includes your Lindblad jump operators, for example. And in principle, although I think no one has done this before, and I always wanted to do it, but yeah, haven't done it yet, is you can still approximate this uh, initial density matrix with a random pure state. And then you can unravel this master equation by some Monte Carlo wave function approach. So you average over trajectories, uh, with random quantum jumps. And this should allow you to study such a situation for system sizes larger than what you can do with exact diagonalization. So again, I included this because I thought you might be interested in, in such situations. Uh, you probably know much better than I do if there are scenarios or 
regimes and parameter space where such a uh, pure state approach might be more powerful than all these nice uh, matrix product state methods for open systems. But yeah, if you have any suggestions where one can use this, uh, I'm always very happy to hear them. Okay. Maybe I, can, maybe I can ask a question about, I mean, I just want to try and understand what you mean by this idea for open platform systems. So what you want to do is you just want to reproduce the environment, you want to replicate the, the ensemble uh, canonical state of the environment by your, one of your sort of uh, canonical typical states and then uh, unravel a sort of effective master equation for that. Is, is, is that the idea? Mm, no, the idea. I think, so what, what these jump operators do, I, I, I leave it completely open. I mean, these jump operators can be whatever they want to be. I think the situation I, I'm just, maybe I'm thinking about this a bit too naively, but I, what I'm thinking about is, well, you have, you just have some, you just assume that you have this initial state. I, I don't care too much where this initial state came from, but, but you have an initial state of this form, such a density matrix, and then it is always possible to approximate this density matrix by a random state. And then this might undergo some time evolution. And during this time evolution, there might be some dissipation in some form, some Lindblad operators uh, that you can imagine. And in such a situation, it should be possible uh, to, yeah, to, to unravel this by some Monte Carlo wave function approach. So whether or not this is any realistic, I don't know, or helpful in any situation. But I, I guess the key is like how to control the Markov approximation when you do something. I mean, are you really Markovian there? I mean, anyway, we can talk afterwards. I'll leave you go ahead, it's, it's, it's okay. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I assume that I have this initial state and I assume that I that I can write everything in Lint platform. That's that's true, but my, maybe there are some interesting applications here. Okay. Um, Great. So these are basically the, the, uh, the applications I wanted to highlight. There are other things that you can do with, with typicality and with random states. For example, you can also look at uh, thermodynamic quantities such as the specific heat at finite temperature for some spin system, say. Uh, but this is not what I want to talk about here. Uh, and now I want to turn to these uh, potential applications of, of random states on these upcoming noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. And the idea for this project uh, or the motivation comes from this uh, quantum supremacy experiment of Google that I'm sure many of you have seen or even read the paper. So Google has this nice new quantum processor, Sycamore, which is a, which is a NISC device with uh, 54 uh, qubits, actually in the experiment, one qubit didn't work. So it had, had 53 qubits on a two dimensional grid. And the problem that they tackled uh, with this device was random circuit sampling. So what does it mean? So initially you prepare all your qubits in the zero state, and then you act with a quasi random circuit on this initial state. So the circuit, has different cycles and each cycle consists of a layer of uh, one qubit gates, so one qubit rotations, and then a layer of two qubit gates, so some gates uh, that create entanglement between the different qubits. And then you repeat this with uh, yeah, different one qubit gates and different connections between the, the, uh, the qubits for the two qubit gates. And you do this a number of times, and then in the end, you measure all the qubits. So generally, your state will be some superposition of your computational basis states. But if you then measure them, then you just, the wave function collapses to just one bit string. So for example, you would measure uh, something like the first qubit is zero, then one, one, zero, zero, one. So this would be one measurement. And then you repeat this experiment over and over again and collect and you always do the same random circuit and you collect a lot of these bit strings. And then the idea is to calculate the probability distribution. So you really want to uh, reproduce the full probability distribution of the state. And this is what was, yeah, this is basically the computational task that was used in this supremacy experiment to show that this device can something uh, much faster than the best supercomputers 
in the world because yeah especially if you look just at this number here i mean 53 qubits this is basically impossible to do with any existing supercomputer so you might say this is uh very nice. I mean, they they have some problem where quantum processors might be better than supercomputers, but this random circuit sampling maybe is not too um, useful, say in any in any sense that we want to apply it to some to some uh, real physical problem. But what I would argue here, or what we propose, is that these random circuits indeed have some direct application and. And the direct application now shouldn't be too surprising for you anymore. It's just that we want to create random states and then use typicality uh, to calculate all these correlation functions, for example, or study transport properties on these NISC devices. And so in the following, I will, I will basically uh, walk you through this proposal, how one might do this and uh, what might be the, the advantages of this proposal. But uh, to, this comes with a disclaimer, of course, that uh, to prevent any disappointment, we, this is just a proposal and we have done some numerical simulations, but we haven't actually run any, anything on a real quantum machine. So, so this is, of course, a caveat here. Okay, but what is the main idea? So the main idea is that we want to study transport properties again, and we want to study transport by means of these uh, local spin-spin correlations that I have shown you before. And the nice thing is now, and uh, you have used this, this trick in your group uh, very recently, and I think it's a very nice trick, is that you can, that you can rewrite this correlation function in such a form. So you basically introduce this projection, uh, which projects on the upstate on one of the spins, and then you can just, just some direct manipulation of this correlation function. Uh, you can rival, rewrite it in this form, and then you can again use typicality uh, to approximate this trace. And what you end up with is that the correlation function between these two spins is basically the expectation value of your local spin within this projected subspace. So you project onto the subspace where this one uh, reference site is projected to the upstate and then you do the time evolution. So you do some quench if you wish, and you calculate the expectation value and this corresponds directly to the correlation function. So you only need to evolve if you wish one state in time. In the beginning, uh, I showed you some uh, construction where you have to evolve two states in time. Here it's only one state. So it's a bit more efficient also. Um, Okay, so how can one translate this on a quantum computer? Well, this is actually very easy. You just prepare your qubits all in the zero state, and then you act with such a random circuit. So exactly such a random circuit that was used in the Sycamore experiment uh, to create a random state, but you do this only, uh, you do this on all qubits except for one. So this would be the state where we do the projection. And then after you have prepared this, random state, you do a unitary time evolution, now of course on all qubits, and then you measure, and this should give you the correlation function, and you can analyze the transport properties. And in this sense, you might say this is a useful application of these random circuits, because you can use them to study transport properties. So before I go into any more detail, let me just show you that it works. Uh, in a sense, so we again consider. Sorry, let's uh, just understand the 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 free qubit, the ancillary qubit, the one you know that's not undergoing the random circuit initially. Yeah. You hold that in the zero state. Exactly. That's exactly. It. Okay. Thanks. Exactly. Then then we do the time evolution. Yeah. No, it's basic. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just uh, translating this equation, basically to a, to a quantum computer uh, to circuit. I mean, it's. Uh, um, and so we are again here just as an example, we again want to study the uh, spin one half Heisenberg chain. And so similar to the Sycamore experiment, we consider such a two dimensional grid, but you can always of course study one dimensional systems when you just pick such a snake, which goes through your 2D system, you can always 
uh, studying the physics of one-dimensional systems also with these two-dimensional grids. And what we do is we look at uh, two quantities. The first is again this spreading of the correlation. So we have this projected state here, the projected site, and then you see that the correlations start to build up and we study how this, how this power law behaves. And what we also do, and this actually what you, these curves you will see a lot in the, on the next slides is that we look at the decay of this, of this initial peak. So this would be the autocorrelation function of the spin, how this decays on the first lattice side. And you see that this also decays at a, with a power law at late times. And we also analyze uh, this power law. And you already see one thing on this slide, namely here on this lower panel, we compare the results that we obtain from a state which we get by a random circuit. So this is what you would do on the quantum computer compared to what you get when you by hand create your state as a hard random state. So you by hand pick your Gaussian random coefficients. And what you see is that both curves coincide perfectly with each other. So this tells you that these random circuits are indeed sufficient. They create enough randomness that you can use all these typicality arguments that I showed you before. Okay, so yeah, let me say, so, so this is basically the proposal and now we wanted to see how stable this is against all the noise that, that comes up in a quantum computer or on these NISC devices because there you have always some imperfections and we wanted to study how stable this proposal is. So, as a first step, uh, let us first look how, how the state gets randomized under the action of this, of this random circuit. So as I've said, everything is very similar compared to this quantum supremacy experiment. So we also consider random circuits or quasi random circuits where we have layers of one qubit gates and two qubit gates. And in this case, the one qubit gates are chosen from this set here. So this are uh, pi half rotations around the x and the y axis of the block sphere. And then we also have this T gate, which is this phase gate here. And the two qubit gates are always, so to create the entanglement are these controlled Z gates. And we apply these controlled Z gates in some pattern, uh, A, B, C, D, and then we repeat again, A, B, C, D. So these patterns are shown here on the left, so the blue, bonds show you where we apply the two qubit gates in each cycle. And so applying this random circuit will, will eventually randomize your state. So your state after applying the circuit will be some superposition of computational basis states. And we wanted to see how fast it, it, it gets scrambled. Say. And, and we looked at two quantities. And the first one I, I call here the participation entropy. Uh, I don't know, you probably have another name for it, or there is another name for it. Uh, so these PKs are the, the absolute squares of these coefficients CK. And so this, this quantity basically measures how much, your, how much your wave function is spread in the computational basis. So in the beginning, this is zero because you start with a, with a state where all qubits are in the zero state. So this is just a product state in this, in this computational basis. So, so this entropy is zero, but then you see that increasing the number of cycles or yeah, applying this, this random circuit over and over, uh, you see that this, this entropy in, uh, grows very rapidly and you saturate very quickly uh, towards the value that you would expect for a completely random state. And you see that this saturation is reached basically independent of the size of the system. So you always need only a small number of cycles to get the saturation to a completely scrambled state. You can also look at different quantity, which is the uh, entanglement entropy. And you see a similar, a similar behavior that also for, for a very small number of cycles, you get saturation to the value that you would expect for a completely random state. So if you compare these two pictures, the uh, it, is, it seems to be that it is a bit slower in the case of the entanglement entropy, but again, the dependence of, on the system size doesn't seem to be too crucial. And uh, uh, 
Right, and this is of course the important point that you, you don't want that your random circuits are too long. You want to use uh, as few gates as possible, but still create a random, a random state that can be used for these typicality tricks. Okay, so now we have our random state and now we want to uh, go one step further in the, in the protocol and look at the time evolution. So the time evolution on a quantum computer is usually done in terms of this Trotter decomposition. So you take your time evolution operator and you split it up in small time steps, delta t. And when you do this, you can then also split, for example, the even bonds of your Hamiltonian and the odd bonds. And by doing this, you make some error. And this error is controlled by the size of the time step. And in case you have never seen this before, uh, I think it's maybe interesting. So how does it look like for, for such a Heisenberg spin chain? So say you have just one bond, two neighboring spins. So how do you translate this Heisenberg interaction on a quantum computer? This is actually, uh, there are many different ways to do this. This is a very efficient one. So you have uh, these one qubit rotations around different axes and with different angles. And then you have three C not gates that you have to apply in between. So by doing this, this would be one time step on a single bond for this Heisenberg spin chain. And now what we did is uh, we wanted to study how, the, how this correlation function depends on the size of the time step. So here the, you see this uh, autocorrelation function. So the decay of the initial peak uh, you have seen this curve before, but now I plot data for different system size, uh, for different time steps, sorry. And for me, this is rather a surprising result. And I find it really interesting that apparently this dynamics doesn't depend, well, let's say almost, there's almost no dependence on the time step uh, at all. And this is, this is a bit counterintuitive, I would say, because if you look at the Trotter decomposition, you would expect that when you increase the time step, then you would also increase the error that you make. But apparently, if you look at, say, observables, and not at the state itself, but you look at physical observables, then everything is much more stable. And this is, of course, very useful, because on these noisy devices, you want to use as few gates as possible so you want to choose a, la a rather large time step such that you can reach a long time in the end, but use as few gates as possible. So, and this suggests that you can actually use a rather large time step and still get the correct physical result. And we analyzed this in, in some more detail. So we looked at, at this hydrodynamic tail and, and looked at how this, how this decays, what the power law is here. So you can get this power law by a log derivative of this curve. And this is shown here in the central panel. And you can see that there are some oscillations that you can almost not see in, in this upper panel, but there are these oscillations in the, uh, in the slope. But again, you see that even in this, well, say really uh, zoomed in uh, representation, you see that, uh, that the different time steps almost have no impact. So all curves are basically on top of each other. And you see that you oscillate around this mean value, which is two thirds. And this is again, an indication or this, this confirms that spin transport in this integrable model is super diffusive and actually even described by this Carter parisi chang uh, universality class. So this is something that has been discussed quite a bit uh, in the community in recent years. Jonas, I have, I have a question about this KPZ scaling. I mean, I always wondered, is super diffusion all, I mean, maybe you know the answer to this, but the super diffusive scaling with this three over two exponent, I mean, is this something you see at all temperatures or just infinite temperature? Because I've only ever seen infinite temperature results for that. Or is it something you expect, you know, generically with temperature? Mm, that's a good question. If you don't know, it's okay. I mean, I don't think- No, I mean, because, I, I mean- No, I would, I would, I would, I would expect that that it that it can definitely change if you go to lower temperatures. I, I see. So I, I don't want to say something completely stupid, but uh, but I think it can change. So it's it's. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Because I mean, I had I, I just 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 to let you know. I mean, at, at one point we 
we were using, I mean, this three over two scaling is super sort of clean when you do sort of, you know, transport experiments and you can use it to kind of benchmark techniques. And one of the, one of our students here, Marilyn, was using it as a sort of benchmark for numerical technique. And I was asking Tom Ashprosen about it, who kind of works directly on this stuff. And he claimed to me that he expects it, you know, over a, a very large temperature range, but I wasn't sure why or anything. And maybe you, I just thought maybe you might know, but it's okay. I mean, no, I, I, yeah, I, I I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, sorry. So, uh, no, but I, yeah, what I wanted, actually what I wanted to say here is that, uh, that even for this very large time step, uh, delta t equals two, uh, so where you here you see some deviations in the in the decay, but even even there when you calculate the slope, you see that okay these oscillations are washed out, but even then you you get this exponent two third, and this is, this is also kind of surprising to me because yeah this exponent two third is really I mean it's really a consequence of the integrability of the model. But, but even for this large time step in the Trotter decomposition, it seems that it is, it's really stable. Uh, so it's kind of surprising to me. Um, okay. And you can also look at the, as I've said, we also look at the spreading of the entire, of the entire density profile. And also in this case, it, the dependence on the time step is rather small and it's consistent with this uh, super diffusive transport. Um, so yeah, so this is rather promising because as I've said before, it tells you that you can use the large time step and still get the correct physical result. So this is of course good on these noisy devices. Uh, so another thing you, you should check is uh, how sensitive is, uh, is your result against, well, generic, uh, generic uh, imperfections that can happen on these devices and one, error model that is that is often used. I mean, it's, it's not clear to me uh, if this really describes the errors that happen on the on the real machine. I think no one really knows this, um, but it's, it's a very generic model. And, and so there are one qubit errors and two qubit errors. So after each gate, you basically have some error probability, either P1 or P2, depending on if you have applied a one qubit gate or a two qubit gate. And so with one, with a probability P1, you, uh, you apply some Pauli matrix to your state. So, uh, so you either apply an X or Y or Z Pauli matrix to the state and with some probability one minus P1, you have a perfect evolution. So no error has occurred. And, and yeah, the gate has, has acted perfectly. And, and similar for the two qubit error, for the two qubit gate uh, errors, you have some error probability P2. Now the things are a bit more complicated because you could have situations where you have an error only on one qubit and the other qubit works perfectly or you have errors on both qubits or in the perfect case in the perfect evolution, of course, there are no errors on both qubits. And so we analyzed this depolarization error model for our case, uh, so for our circuit, and we made an assumption on the error rate, which might be relatively realistic. So we just introduced a single error rate, which is here the error rate of the two qubit gates. And we said that this should be 10 times larger than the one qubit error gate, uh, one, uh, one qubit uh, gate error. And so this might, might be rather realistic because these one qubit gates can be performed with a higher fidelity than the two qubit gates. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you, you can you can solve this uh, or you can analyze this depolarization error model again rather efficiently by averaging over quantum tra trajectories. So you just pick again your your random initial state, and then you have some uh, errors randomly uh, in space and time. So these Pauli errors, and in the end you average over all these trajectories to to see the effect of this depolarization error model. And so we analyzed this for the circuit and let's first look, uh, so this plot is rather busy. So let's go uh, panel by panel. So on the top panel, we analyzed the situation where we only have errors in the random circuit. So the time evolution is perfect and only the random circuit is noisy. And 
what you see is that independent of the size of the arrow, so this is written in some complicated form here, but uh, independent of the size of the arrow, all curves agree with each other. And what this tells you is that although in the beginning, I told you that for typicality, you should have these Gaussian random state where these coefficients are drawn from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, in practice, it is not so important for typicality how this randomness looks like, because one can show that if you have these errors, then actually your probability distribution changes. But as long as your state is still random enough in some sense, you still get a perfect result. So typicality also works in this case. But of course, this is not the most interesting case. And in, uh, yeah, in a real experiment, you would of course have errors also, you would have errors in the random circuit and also in the unitary time evolution. And this is shown here in the center panel. Again, we are always looking at this decay of this initial peak. And you see that now the curves definitely depend on the error. And for small errors, you still get this uh, hydrodynamic uh, power law decay. But if you increase the error rate, then you see that this power law gradually becomes an exponential decay. And this is what one would expect for these depolarization errors that eventually your signal gets exponentially damped. So this is, of course, maybe not too promising. So if your errors become too large, you really can't see this hydrodynamic tail anymore. But what might, what might help you is that instead of looking at this local probe, you can also look at the spreading of the entire density profile. So here in the bottom panel, I show this uh, mean square displacement again, so the width of this density profile. And you can see that here the, um, the curves look all rather similar. So the impact of the errors uh, of the noise doesn't seem to be too strong and you get this correct power law behavior. Um, so one explanation for this might of course be that our initial state is, uh, is basically a random state. You only have this initial projection on this one lattice side. So if you then have some noise, some errors, on some letter sites, on some letter sites that are far away from this peak, then this probably shouldn't have too much of an impact because your state is random from the very beginning. So if you do some some error there, this shouldn't have such a big impact, and so it shouldn't uh, have a have a big impact on the overall spreading of the density. Uh, yeah. So, but again, I mean, this is so this. This would make, uh, make me hopeful that one can use this typicality approach to study transport on these NISC devices. And yeah, as I just said, this randomness might really help you because it makes you less sensitive to these errors because your state is random from the very beginning. Uh, but of course, I mean, this is just numerical simulations and it's hard to tell what would happen uh, with a real machine. Okay, so this is, Basically, the main result that I wanted to show you, on the one hand, we have these small trotter errors, and on the other hand, there might be this uh, potential that errors are not too big uh, due to noise that one can really study transport on these devices with typicality. And on my last slide, I just want to make one more point, and that is that you can, of course, do this for two-dimensional systems. And if you think about applications of NISC devices, this might actually be the more interesting case because for these one-dimensional systems, you of course have all these very powerful numerical methods. But I think in my opinion, it would be good to think about how these NISC devices can help you for two-dimensional systems where less numerical methods are available. And so in 2D, this Heisenberg chain becomes non-integrable and we can again do the same trick. So we do our random circuit and we do the time evolution. And now you see, instead of super diffusion, you now get again, perfect normal diffusion. So this one over T decay. And another thing that might be interesting is, so you might say, well, why do I need randomness at all? So, I mean, this is really necessary to have this random state. And the answer is yes, in some cases, this is really necessary. So consider, for example, this non-random product state where you prepare all your spins in the X state and only the center, the center qubit is prepared in the up state. So at time zero, this would basically give you the same, the same initial density profile. You have some excitation 
on top of a homogeneous background. But when you then look at the dynamics, it looks really strange. It's definitely not this nice uh, diffusive uh, transport. You don't get this hydrodynamic tail at all. So in this case, randomness might really be necessary and helpful to see the correct transport behavior. Okay, so this is everything I wanted to tell you. I think I've spoken uh, way too long. I'm sorry for that. So I hope I convinced you that typicality can be a really useful numerical method and that it might also be useful for these uh, upcoming noisy quantum devices. 